This is Salem, Massachusetts, a popular tourist destination, infamous for its 17th century reign of terror. In 1692, a group of young girls cried witch, and 20 innocent people were led to their deaths. Now, the town of Salem is home to thousands of real witches, and a dark, shameful mystery that's never been solved. Cross this threshold to places of mystery. Tucked away on the New England coastline just north of Boston is one of the most mysterious places in America, Salem, Massachusetts. At first glance, it seems just like another tourist town with its quaint seaport and charming old buildings on cobblestone streets. But take a closer look. There's something special about Salem. It's a haven for witches. Lori Cabot is the official witch of the modern-day Salem. Witches from all over the world come and join with us. So it's not just our energy here. It is the witches of the world. Even non-witches, like Alison DeMario, director of education at the Salem Witch Museum, feel that Salem is unlike any other place on Earth. Well, I think it's got a lot of... A lot of power. There's a lot going on here, and um, I don't know if I've ever felt any, any mystical uh, <clears throat> experience here, but I think it's not an ordinary city. But that power comes from a mysterious tragedy. This is the site of the Salem Witch Trials, one of the darkest passages in American history. The trials inspired numerous books, plays, and movies, including the 1972 film, Three Sovereigns for Sarah. 300 years ago, 19 innocent people met death at the end of a rope, while another man's life was literally crushed from his body, all because of the accusations of a group of young girls. What led to these lies? Why did the townspeople murder their friends and neighbors? And why is Salem, even today, a witch's brew of magic and mystery? Salem has yet to give up her secrets. To look for answers, one must travel back to 1692, when fear and hysteria ruled Salem for 10 terrifying months. The town was populated by Puritans, a strict Protestant sect. They very much believed in the, in the existence of Satan, his power, his determination to overcome God. Their little community was founded on God's approval. If for any reason God abandoned them, they'd be totally lost. So uh, the idea of a person signing a pact with the devil and going over to the devil's side was terrifying to them. Today we know that witchcraft, also called Wicca, is a nature-based religion that has nothing to do with worshiping the devil. But for centuries, many people thought otherwise. To the Puritans, witches were Satanists who received special privileges, such as long life in exchange for their service. Several men were uh, 82 years old. Rebecca Nurse, one of the victims, was 72. Was this fear of witchcraft entirely unwarranted, or did a secret society of devil worshippers really exist? British law, which governed Salem as well as the rest of colonial America, took satanic threats seriously. The punishment for practicing witchcraft, death by hanging. It was in this atmosphere of paranoia and superstition that both her and niece of Reverend Samuel Paris, the town's minister, began to behave in a bizarre manner. These girls started having all sorts of fits uh, similar to uh, epilepsy, but different. Richard Trask is the chief archivist at the Essex Peabody Museum, where many of the witch trial artifacts are housed. They would contort themselves. Uh, they would fall down. They would rush into the fireplace as if to burn themselves up. They would cry of all sorts of uh, s things sticking in their body and whatever. Other girls in the village started acting the same way, and the townspeople demanded an explanation. 
In the 1600s, there was only one place to look for answers to the unexplainable, the supernatural world. So the idea started circulating in the neighborhood that maybe this had something to do with witchcraft. Town leaders became convinced that the specters or spirits of Satan worshippers were attacking the girls, and absolute evil was about to crush the entire community. The only way to survive was to find and destroy the witches who were afflicting the girls. The little girls finally, after much persuasion and coercion, I'm sure, named three names. Those three women were brought in for questioning. Two of them denied anything to do with the practice of witchcraft, but the third, very interestingly, confessed to practicing witchcraft. That woman was Tichaba, a slave from Barbados who was owned by the Reverend Paris. She confessed that, in fact, a black man who had come to the parsonage, not able to be seen by anyone except the children and her, had told her specifically to afflict the children, to hurt the children and maybe even kill the children. She said, yes, uh, I have afflicted them. These other two women have also, and there are several others as yet unknown to you who are also doing afflicting. The magistrates believed her. They threw her and the other two women in jail, and the girls, instead of getting better, actually got worse. Why did Tichaba make up this story? Some historians believe she was coerced by her master, Reverend Paris. Tichaba's confession transformed the investigation into a feeding frenzy of accusations, which led to the travesty of justice known as the Salem Witch Trials. Physical evidence of witchcraft was hard to find, so the court relied on a 17th century legal concept known as spectral evidence. Spectral evidence is invisible. For example, a townsperson in Salem Village could say, the specter or the ghost of Bridget Bishop came to me in the night and said she was going to harm me and said she was going to make my children ill and torment me. Now, if you say that on a piece of paper, on a complaint, and sign it, that's evidence. Now, Bridget Bishop could say, I never did, what do you mean? It was in my house, of course I never did that. But spectral evidence was impossible to disprove. The other thing that many of the ministers and magistrates believed was the idea that God would never allow an innocent person's specter to be seen to hurt someone. Therefore, if your specter was hurting someone and that person testified against you, automatically you were guilty. Those accused of witchcraft had only two options, confess to the crime or die. Over the eight months of the witchcraft uh, proceedings, something like about 200 people were accused of practicing witchcraft. Of that group, at least 50 confessed that they were witches. They had terrible pressures being exerted upon them to confess. And they started learning very quickly that if you didn't confess, if you went to trial, chances are you were going to be hanged. Whereas if you confessed, they kind of forgot you for a while. You might eventually be hanged, but the fact of the matter was no one who confessed was ever uh, brought to trial and hanged. A proud few, 19 in all, refused to confess to a crime they did not commit. Each one was convicted on spectral evidence alone, led to Gallows Hill and hanged. Another man who refused to cooperate with the court was pressed to death under heavy stones. Finally, William Phipps, the governor of Massachusetts, realized that spectral evidence was responsible for horrible tragedy. In a community of only 500 people, almost a third had been accused of witchcraft. He declared that spectral evidence was no longer valid. The Salem witch trials were over after 10 months of terror. But for three centuries, the cause of the girl's strange behavior has remained a mystery. Why did they do it? Stay tuned. Salem, Massachusetts. 
a mysterious town with shameful secrets and a tragic past. In 1692, the Salem witch trials devastated the small community. Over 200 people accused, scores thrown in jail, and 20 innocent residents killed, all because a group of girls lied. The end of the trial off the beginning of the effort to understand how and why this could have happened. But 300 years later, the old questions remain unanswered, and new questions abound. Chief among them, what caused the girls to act possessed? What it was, we still don't know. They were acting strangely, and some meddling neighbors started looking into it a little bit more, and instead of stopping what was happening, they only encouraged it. And instead of separating the children from these strange things, they kept them gathered together, so they kind of fed upon one another. There are a number of incidents in the history in which you see that when people become afraid of something that they don't understand very well, they can become absolutely irrational and do things that normally they wouldn't do. And this is what, uh, what clinical hysteria is all about. If it was hysteria, where did it originate? And more importantly, why? Written materials from the time suggest that the girls had been dabbling in spiritualism. We do know they were telling fortunes, which they knew they shouldn't be doing under Puritan religious beliefs, and I'm sure that frightened them. They were trying to determine who they'd marry by putting an egg white into a container of water and discerning a shape from the egg white. For instance, if it was a hammer, maybe the little girl would grow up to marry a carpenter. One little girl saw a coffin signifying death, and that scared her. Plus, living in such a repressive community may have left them emotionally scarred. I don't think they were particularly healthy by our standards. They were living under a very fearful religious code. Certainly they were little girls. They were, you know, bored probably, nervous. Little girls in groups, as you know, catch all the same symptoms from each other, whatever those symptoms happen to be. Even so, why didn't the girls stop the accusations and charades once they saw the deadly results? I personally think that once they started and they saw adults were going to pay attention to them and that adults were going to be arrested, the power of that and the shame if they had had to say, oh, we made a mistake, very difficult to do. One girl, Mary Warren, did try to do that, tried to say this wasn't, this wasn't right, and all the other girls turned on her and accused her of being a witch. However... There are those who believe that the girl's aberrant behavior was physiologically induced. There is a theory that they were eating ergot, which is a, a mold that grows on rye. And uh, if the mold had gotten into the rye, which it might have done, and then the rye was made into bread, then you would have the effect of a hallucinogenic drug. Some people blame Tichaba for the girl's actions. Did she fill the girls' heads with her own spiritual beliefs? Well, Tichaba was not a witch. Tichaba was a Rasha, and they, they believed in spirit, and that's an African religion. And most religions have a history of mysticism. So she was teaching the children or telling tales of their um, sort of mythical experiences and, of course, that came under their wrong definition of the word witch. And the girls, of course, got frightened by it or empowered by it. Salem's official witch is convinced the girl's strange behavior was firmly rooted in the secular world. I think it was a childish prank gone wild because it was their way of, uh, in puritanical times, children had no say whatsoever. And if people were then not good to them, um, it was a mystical way or a religious way of playing a prank, but I think it did get out of hand and well beyond what they expected. So was it repressed emotion that caused the girls to behave the way they did? Or was it hallucinogenic mold, an act of revenge, or a childish prank gone awry? Or maybe it was really Satanism that drove these girls to tell such dreadful lies. 
There is now evidence suggesting that some citizens of Salem were practicing the black arts. Deep in a wooded section of what used to be Salem Village is a granite boulder known as Witch Rock. In the 1980s, faint markings were discovered on one side. In the right light, a pentagram and other markings associated with Satanism can clearly be seen. Scientists from Harvard University examined samples of the pigment used to mark the rock. Their findings have intriguing implications. According to the scientists, the pigment dates back to the late 1600s. Was Satanism being practiced at the time of the Salem witch trials? And were any of the accused devil worshippers? No one knows for sure, yet one thing is certain. The spirits of both the victims and their accusers still haunt the town today. The Salem witch trials ended 300 years ago, but the town remains haunted by its tragic past. Although the trials took place in Salem, most of the accused and their accusers actually lived five miles north in what was then called Salem Village, the homestead of Rebecca Nurse, who perished on Gallows Hill, still stands, looking much like it did in 1692. After the witch trials ended, Salem Village renamed itself Danvers in an effort to distance itself from its unsavory past. Salem Village, Danvers, when it was over, just suffered terribly. All of their institutions had failed. Neighbors had people who were accusers and accused. And these people didn't leave. They remained here for generations. I have several uh, witches in my uh, ancestry, which anyone who really has lived in this area long enough will probably uh, find as well. And people in Danvers, the old townies, uh, just believe that this was such a sad, terrible event that they didn't want to talk about it anymore. So when I was a kid uh, in Danvers, uh, the old townies who were still here just believed that in proper society you didn't talk about the witchcraft. And it really wasn't until our 300th anniversary, 1992, uh, that the people of Danvers finally did a commemoration, built a monument, and uh, looked at the, at the past and saw that there were good things that had come out of it as well. The town of Salem has erected a less traditional monument, a stone wall embedded with 20 slabs. They're inscribed with the names of the brave men and women who sacrificed their lives for the truth. I think it's a perfect example of people being victimized by fear and intolerance. And the fact that they were willing to die rather than lie about themselves and that's what happened. Nineteen people, rather than confess to something they didn't do, were hanged, is extraordinarily inspirational. I, I can't help but admire them enormously. A number of these accused witches, they believed that truth was more important than life itself. They could have, like the 50 who, who confessed and survived, survived to live out the rest of their life. They chose, however, to tell what they believed to be the truth. There are those who say that what happened in Salem could never happen today, but not everyone agrees. Witch hunts still happen. Uh, you look around for somebody to blame and then that theoretically solves the problem. People were hung, tortured, and died in jail. We view what happened in 1692 very similar to the McCarthy era, to Hitler, to many holocausts. Indeed, it seems the lessons of the Salem witch trials must be learned by each new generation. We think that uh, this witchcraft hysteria was something of 300 years ago and we're much more sophisticated today. But witch hysterias, how many times do you hear that in the news today about, oh, it's another Salem witch hunt? Well, there are a lot of Salem witch hunts, even today in our own society. And this uh, memorial was as much commemorating the idea that we have to confront our own 
witch hunts today with integrity, clear vision, and bravery, um, because if we don't, we'll fail as a society. Most historians are certain that the 20 people executed as witches were innocent of that crime. But if there were no witches in Salem in 1692, why do today's witches flock to a town where once they would have faced certain death? I think this has become a witch mecca because of the history of Salem. And now that we're here and can help explain it, it has become a place for witches to come and share their energy. Lori Cabot is convinced that the victims of the Salem witch trials are grateful that real witches have made Salem their home today. I think because we are here, there is an uplifting of the spirits of those people because it's more defined as to what really happened. Their story is being told over and over and over from many different perspectives, from a historic perspective, from ours. And I think it's a freedom of their spirit, and I think that it's made the place happy. The spirits of Salem's victims may have made peace with their fates, and their stories will never be forgotten. But the force that planted those seeds of terror remains buried in Salem's infamous past and in the darkest recesses of the human heart.